Hi, I'm Marcia Franklin, the producer and host of Conversations from the Sun Valley Writers Conference. I hope you enjoy this interview, which was recorded at the renowned event in 2016. And don't forget to subscribe to this podcast to hear more of the illuminating speakers who shared with me their thoughts on literature and life. Presentation of Dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore and Bettis family legacy of building the great state of Idaho. By the Friends of Idaho Public Television and by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. I just remember sitting there thinking, this is this could be where it all where it all ends. <laughs> Coming up, a conversation with the creators of the blockbuster HBO series, Game of Thrones. You'll learn about their journey from being two writers with virtually no experience in television to running one of the most popular TV shows in history. That's Dialogue Next. Stay tuned. Hello and welcome to Dialogue. I'm Marcia Franklin. If you haven't heard of Game of Thrones, the award-winning HBO series, you just might be one of the few in our country who hasn't. An estimated 23 million people in the United States now watch each episode, either on TV, online, or on DVD. The series, which will ultimately span eight seasons, is an adaptation of the best-selling fantasy novels by George R. R. Martin. Set on two fictional continents, it depicts the brutal battles between different family dynasties for the Iron Throne of the Seven Kingdoms. It's been both lauded for its storylines, acting, and special effects, and criticized for what some view as its gratuitous violence. The two lead writers and showrunners of the series, David Benioff and Dan Weiss, would be the first to say they had no idea what they were getting into when they pitched the idea to HBO more than 10 years ago. But they felt compelled to try, and the risk has paid off. The series now has more primetime Emmys than any other scripted show in television history. I sat down with the two at the 2016 Sun Valley Writers Conference to learn more about what inspires them as well as how they respond to critics. Well, first of all, welcome. Welcome to Idaho. It's great to have you here. Thank you for having us. Yes, thank you. And, and you know, David, it's, we're not that far. I looked on a map. It's a straight shot to Moose, Wyoming. That's right. And That's I understand right. you were a DJ there. I was. KMTM. Okay, I wondered if it was K-Hole because that is the, those are the greatest letters you know yeah, station K-hole. call letters <laughs> wasn't k-hole though right it wasn't k-hole <laughs> i was a little worried about working for a place called k-hole um yeah it was kmtn the mountain that's the other those are other good calls. is that how you letters. said it yeah well i tried to go as deep as possible so that's K-M-T-N. where the character the mountain K-M-T-N, comes from right the mountain yes. well, that and george martin he's from but, wyoming uh, <laughs> but i did the graveyard shift from midnight till six in the morning and so it inspired some of the very frigid scenes in Game of Thrones. Is <laughs> your, your time in Moose, Wyoming. I guess so, and City of Thieves. I guess, yeah, there's something about snow, snow ice. Snow yeah, and ice. It is, there's something appealing about it. <laughs> we like going to Iceland, too. It's a fun country to work in. So we always try to come up with some more scenes set on glaciers or frozen, frozen lakes. Does it seem a long time ago since the two of you met? It would be 20, 21 years since Ireland. <laughs> when you met together. A lot say, less gray in my beard. Yeah, um, I yeah. can't say that we had this in mind when we were drinking <laughs> Guinness uh, at, uh, in the, the various pubs of, uh, of Dublin. This, uh, well, this an was an incredible a adventure. Yeah, it really has been. It's kind of calm. It started in uh, Dublin and it brought us back to 90 minutes up the road to Belfast. So it's a definite Irish, uh, Irish theme in there two, somewhere. Two Jewish guys in, yeah, in sure. Ireland getting together. Yeah, that was the strange thing. Everyone would always ask us, oh, you know, one of your parents from Ireland or grandparents or something, and we were probably the only Yanks there who had no Irish connection yeah. whatsoever. You know, almost most Americans seem to have some somebody in their family from mm-hmm. their not, nothing for so us. Something like 40, 45 percent have at least that right? like one grandparent. That yeah. has- <laughs> well, I was thinking about the trajectory and, and also about the fact that you were right. You wrote a thesis on Beckett, and I was wondering what Beckett would think about all of this uh, transformation and change in your life. Uh, <laughs> I did find one quote that might summarize it a bit. You okay. know, you both have admitted that you went into this with 
very little experience. Yeah. And there's a great quote from Worstwood Ho where he says, try again, oh. fail again, fail better. Yeah, you have that that's up pretty in much your house, used don't you? Yeah, that's, yeah. that's hanging in my office. And uh, we have pretty much used it in you know, a slightly askew oh, yeah, we version ripped it of off, it. Uh, we ripped it off for the Dav first episode. Davos, right? Davos, yeah, Davos says it to John. John. John Snow after he yeah. gets resurrected. And John Snow also says there's no shame and fear. My father told me what matters is how we face it. So I imagine in this whole uh, timeline, there have been some failures and fears. There definitely were. A lot of both. Still a lot of fear. We went into it with no experience uh, in television whatsoever and, and, uh, and made a tremendous number of mistakes for the first year. I mean, still make mistakes every year, but I think, um, but you know, hopefully learning as we go and, and uh, improving things. But we just didn't have any production experience, so we came in kind of knowing how we wanted to write it, but not knowing anything about the casting process, the editing process, working with visual effects, working with a production designer, all that stuff that you need to know. And it's been a, a steep learning curve. And, and um, you know, I, I just am thankful that we got a chance to do it because it very easily could have gone the other way when, when uh, we started. And I remember but being in Malta when we were shooting the first season and it was in this sort of crucible period where it really looked like everything could go badly. They weren't going to give us any more money because we already spent uh, quite a bit. And the weather was terrible and we were in this RV that was getting blown back and forth by these massive hurricane gusts of wind. I just remember sitting there thinking, this is this could be where it all where it all ends, <laughs> but uh, luckily the the clouds cleared and we we got what we needed. I think our producer at the time said this week will be our Waterloo. <laughs> it's unclear at this point whether we're <laughs> Wellington or Napoleon. <laughs> it really Ignorance. was yeah, it really was just if we had known what we would have to know to do this well, I think the the intimidation factor m may have gotten the best of us. But we we were just filled with excitement over the prospect. We knew that done right, George's books could really be something tremendous. And, and we just, we were so excited, we just kind of barreled into this situation without really knowing uh, what we didn't know. It was that they were unknown unknowns. And that is key, isn't it? You picked up these, these books, or you were sent the books by Martin's agent. You read a thousand pages, as I understand, whether that's apocryphal or not, I'm going to believe that it's mm -hmm. true. That you read a thousand pages in a night. It just, I think it was two. It was two days. Two, two yeah, days. Yeah. Uh, it, it, something about those books just just went inside of you, just grabbed you. Mm -hmm. um, I think you said they're like crack on paper, you know, and that, that was that, there's something addictive. I've never, I I've never actually smoked yeah, crack, I'm, so it's kind of <laughs> I'm not don't know what I'm talking about. But well, okay. like what I imagine crack to be like. Um, but I, I don't read as fast as Dan does, but I remember just, just being in my bed at home reading these books endlessly and my wife just not understand, just being like, are you kidding me? <laughs> You're still reading these books about dragons and ice demons? What's wrong with you? I've heard you say it's, it, it, that you were attracted to the fact that there, were, there are real people in his stories living in a world of magic. Yeah, that's what felt so groundbreaking about it. I mean, it, it was, there are certain... Um, well-established fantasy tropes in the book that that we've seen before, you know, the dragons and giants and and uh, demons and magic. But but the characters felt like real people who just happened to live in a world where these supernatural things existed. And and uh, you know, it, it's there's something about. I don't think there's any way I could have stuck with that many thousands of pages. I know there's no way um, if I hadn't fallen in love with the characters, because that's ultimately what compels me about any good story is that I, I become, you know, whether or not they're good people, it's not necessarily loving them in the way that you love a friend, but finding them incredibly compelling and just wanting to know what's going to happen to them. I mean, that's sort of the key to any good writing, I think. And, and uh, with George's books, it was falling in love with these characters and then watching in horror as he killed them. <laughs> You know, and now he gets to watch in horror as you kill him <laughs> yeah, off. Yeah, we're killing him even quicker than he did. Because so. you're, you're past <laughs> Yeah, you're We past actually have him. to pay our characters, and, and yeah, he doesn't, yeah, so yeah. it's a different situation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we'll talk about that okay. uh, in a moment. But uh, as you say, there's lots of shades of gray in the characters. Uh, it's not just good versus evil. You've got there good people. There are 50 shades got, of gray. Yeah, yes, I was going to say, gross. not 50 shades of gray. But... <laughs> Uh, although, although, <laughs> there is the criticism, of course, that there is... Uh, I don't know, if I hadn't said that, would we never have segued into this question? We'll never know, oh, will God. we? Uh, but yes, there's a, a criticism. I, I learned a new word researching. Sex position. Sex position, Yeah, yes. I like that word. 
there's been a criticism that uh, with uh, to move exposition along and long monologues, you have gratuitous sex scenes going on mm. in the background. Mm. Who said that? Well, we haven't, we haven't done that in a long time. <laughs> it's been seasons and seasons you know, since we've done that. People don't like it. Yeah. Uh, I, what am I going to say? I, I yeah. no no real interest in defending it. You know, it's, yeah. it's uh, it is what it is. People people. It's one of the. It, it is one of those things that for every person who criticizes something vocally, there, for all you know, there are ten people who really enjoyed it. But it's for whatever reason they're not putting their voices out there. So you can't. You just if you start listening to every every criticism, it'll it'll tear what you do apart because the criticisms are many of them mutually exclusive to people. There are going to be people who think it's moving too quickly, there are going to be people who think it's moving too slowly, people who think there's too much violence, people who think there's not enough violence. And we just, we make the show that we want to watch. We would want to watch if we were reviewers. So uh, some people are going to like it and some people aren't. And you don't read anymore what, what people no. say online. No, I mean, you know, when sometimes if there's a huge hubbub or um, it becomes like a front page story, which has happened, uh, um, it's almost impossible to avoid or, or well-meaning friends will send you, say, oh my God, did you see this? And you think it's going to be some, <laughs> something great and you hit a link and it says, yeah. you know, something really Senator horrible. Claire McCaskill says she's never going to watch right, right. your show again right. because well, she well. is upset by the number of rapes in it. Right. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that was a, a very strong uh, thread in the news for, mm -hmm. for, for a while. Mm -hmm. um, We've somehow survived Senator McCaskill's defection. Yes. So, you know, um, I just fundamentally disagree. I think the idea that, that depicting a brutal crime um, indicates endorsement of that crime is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, so that's all I'm going to say. I disagree. It's arguable that the sanitizing representations of violence is more harmful than more graphic depictions of violence that make you feel the way violence probably should make you feel, which is uncomfortable and horrified. And we, we try not to put it in a cartoon, you know, cartoony place when, because that's just, that's not what the books did. That's not what history is about. And, and it just seems fundamentally dishonest to us to, to have violence depicted that way in a more stylized, less gritty way. Yeah, I, I just, I, honestly, I feel like it's an absurd criticism. I think you go back to any book that, that I find is memorable that deals with um, violent subjects and, you know, the graphic scenes in Dante's Inferno, uh, the, the graphic scenes in the Bible, mm -hmm. um, they're not on screen. Uh, obviously, there have been screen adaptations, mm -hmm. but just because they're not on screen doesn't mean that they're not describing mm -hmm. unbelievable, um, unbelievable atrocities. And, you know, this is a very violent world that George depicts in his world, and it felt fundamentally dishonest to us, as Dan said, to approach it without um, being honest to that. And that was part of our initial pitch to HBO. You know, this is not Tolkien. Um, in a kind of sexless world where, as far as we know, the hobbits have never once contemplated anything erotic. Um, it's just not this world. And this is a world where it's not humans against orcs, it's humans against humans and, and uh, doing horrible things to each other. And that's the story. And I totally understand that some people aren't going to want to watch that story and, and that the violence level is too much for them or the sexual level is too much. But, you know, luckily we live in a world now where there's something like 460 scripted yeah. series uh, mm -hmm. on air every year, and there's a great variety of choice for people. So nobody's forced to watch it. And, and uh, you know, there, there are people in my family who, who don't like the level of violence and don't want to watch, and that's absolutely fine. When you do meet somebody, well, let's just say it's your grandmother. Mm -hmm. uh, if she, I don't know if she's still around, but if you were to describe the series to your grandmom, what would you tell her it's about? Huh. <laughs> See, my grandmother, uh, neither of my grandmothers are, are with us any longer, unfortunately. One of my grandmothers would have loved this show because she read, it was her bookshelf that had all the steamy books on it that I would like sneak off the bookshelf and look for the, look for the, the naughty bits when I was uh, 10 years old. Um, I guess I would tell her it was more like she was a big fan of the James Clavell books and I would tell her it's, it's a lot more like a James Clavell book with bits of uh, bits of magic around the edges than uh, than those uh, fantasy books that maybe she'd seen at the bookstore and 
walked past on the way to the James Clavell books. I, yeah, my grandmothers are not around anymore. I did make the mistake of watching one episode with my mom, um, and it was it, uh, Joffrey, the evil prince, is doing something horrible to a prostitute. And I would say, well, you know, that that was a definite mistake. Um, <laughs> but you know, she she loves the show, and I, I think obviously it's it's she's a, a biased woman. But um, it's been fun to see people like our four parents, you know, who are all in their 70s, yeah. right? And you know, who you wouldn't think of as, as fans of this kind of thing, um, really becoming obsessed with it and getting like texts from my, getting texts from my mother with OMG, three exclamation points after some <laughs> big surprising scene. It's like, mom, what? So when do you start texting like a 12 year old? Yeah. Uh, so. um, season six has gotten so many accolades and amazing performances by very strong women. And there's also been the question of whether you did respond to any kind of criticism uh, about. No, I mean when we were plotting season five, all the, the we'd been we've been talking about the end game and the end point for years ever since we started. So all the like for Sansa is just one example where she was headed, uh, or where Cersei was headed. These were all things that we had discussed at length before shoot, writing or shooting season five. We, we, season five was, was the trajectories of the characters through this previous season were already aimed at the current season. So it wasn't in any way a response to, we, we don't, it's just, it's not writing. Writing with a committee of two people or four people is something you can do. Writing with a committee of, uh, of a million people uh, who you poll for every decision online is, I've, to my knowledge, nothing good has ever been done that way. So we really just, that's not how we, how we work. Uh, the easiest way to look at it is, is we finished our outline for season six in early February. Yeah. Um, and the show didn't air, season five didn't air until April of that year. So, so all of season six was mapped out in, mm -hmm. in incredible detail. And we didn't go back and make changes because of of criticism for it, you know, every, as Dan said, everything where, where Sansa was going, it just wouldn't work. I mean, you, you, I think the reason this season worked for a lot of people is that things kind of clicked into place that have been set up for a long, long time, for many seasons, and uh, it just doesn't work if every year we started fresh and thought, okay, now where are these char characters gonna go this year? It has to be, it's the kind of story that just needs a long-term plan. And you guys, you know where you're going. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're, you're writing or have written you know where the we're going. end by now. We haven't, we haven't written Close it. We've it. talked it over a mm -hmm. million times. And uh, yeah, I mean, we could write it. We, we, we know enough about it now that we could write the final episode um, today if we had to. And, uh, you know, um, so we know where we're heading, which is, again, I, I, I can't start a book if I don't know where it's going to end. And it's very hard to work on something this big if you don't have a sense of direction. One of the things I found interesting, I, I really enjoyed um, your book. We have it here, City of Thieves. And um, as, I, as I thought about Game of Thrones coming at it as a newbie, you know, and, and trying to understand it, it seemed a lot like a big game of human chess, which I, I never really understood chess that well. <laughs> My brothers are really good at it, yeah. so I'd watch them. But the queen, obviously, is a powerful piece. And chess figures in City of Thieves as, yeah. as well. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if that, if some of the plotting does remind you as, as well of a great big human game of chess. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I also am not a, a good chess player, but I grew up with an obsessive chess playing father um, who's got, uh, you know, all his shell bookshelves are filled with chess books. And I and saw when we were in, I took my son to New York and we stayed with David's parents and he has thousands of chess books. It's another language. It is another language, which I've never really learned to speak, but I've always been fascinated more as an abstraction than the actual game. Um, I mean, Dan's eight-year-old son could beat me. Um, that's not even he's, an exaggeration. He's, he's pretty beaten, good, yeah. He's beaten Peter Dinklage. Um, we have the photographic <laughs> evidence of it. So, um, but yeah, it's very much, um, and I think that comes from, from, from George's books, you know, the sense of, of, of characters trying to play each other and, and, uh, and there's a very specific reason he chose the title Game of Thrones. And that's why, even though it's not the title of his entire series, it's just the title of the first book, we thought it was the best descriptor of the entire show. And so that's why we chose Game of Thrones for the series title, as opposed to, I guess, The Song of Ice and Fire. Mm -hmm. The other thing that interests me um, from a meta perspective is this concept of all of us having both male and female in ourselves. You have men that have very highly developed feminine sides mm -hmm. in them, and you have 
women that, and I'm talking now in a classic sense, or you know, what we think of traditionally, and women who have highly developed masculine sides. You know that there's not one or the other, mm -hmm. which is. Yeah, even in, on the anatomical level, you know, you look <laughs> at the number of eunuchs in the show, and that's it's a very eunuch-heavy show. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think we must have more eunuchs than any show. I mean, there are literally th eunuchs. literally thousands of eunuchs yeah. in the show. Yeah. So. I think we win there. I won't ask you about the casting call for that. <laughs> I guess I just did. Um, <laughs> uh, w one question we had uh, from a viewer is, what's the secret to keeping audiences tuned into a show where fan-favorite characters can die at any time? It's had a lot of characters. <laughs> as long as you have enough characters left that they like, one or two go, go missing. Yeah, if they know? all died, it would be a problem. Um, yeah. Rebirth? Yeah, make, that helps. Make that the show a lot helps. easier to produce. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't, I mean, it's a tough question. It's, it gets to the heart of, you know, I think it goes back to the books also. It, it's, um, first of all, as Dan said, there are many characters. So it's not just, you know, the first season Ned dies, but there's still a great number of characters that we love. The Red Wedding um, removes uh, four or five characters that, that would have become beloved from the, from the board, but we still have Arya, we still have Jon Snow for a while. Um, and yeah, that, that definitely helps. And I think just ultimately you just want to see what's going to happen. Um, and there's a kind of a craving to know. And, and so you get that in all these spoiler sites out there or, or uh, um, you know, people like sneaking around near the set with these um, cameras trying to get pictures uh, of, of the characters in costume so they can post it online and spoil it for everybody, mm -hmm. which I don't get. Like that's the, that's the mm -hmm. one thing. The criticism I get, um, might not agree with it, but I get it. The spoiler thing, I just don't get. I just, mm -hmm. it's to me, it's like, not only is it like looking at the last page of a book and learning what happened, but it's then ripping out that page and putting it on the library wall so that you can ruin it for everybody. So, those are the people I don't like. <laughs> How do you keep everything so um, secret once you have uh, written it's very, something? It's difficult. It's really hard. Yeah, you have to be real. I mean, we, you know, we talk to our friend. Ryan Johnson has just finished shooting a, a Star Wars movie, and we've talked to him about the way that they do a very good job of keeping everything on double secret lockdown. And you know, we as, the, as we go on, especially as we come to the end of, of the run of, of the show, uh, the, the thirst of people to find out what's going to happen seems to grow, um, which makes our job in terms of keeping the scripts on lockdown a lot harder. We've taken a lot of precautions. How, going back to this issue of, of ha never having done this before and, uh, you know, being afraid and everything, you just, it, it, how do you handle that? I, how do you plow ahead? The fear part? Yeah. Deal with, uh, work with people who are really, really talented who help you? Well, that, that's a huge part of it. I mean, you know, one thing we were talking about here last night was that the television is a team sport as opposed to writing a novel, which is a solitary endeavor. Um, in television, you know, we're, we're, we have our jobs, but there, there are hundreds of people around us who are very, very good at what they do and who work incredibly hard, and they take a massive amount of the workload off. And, and, uh, I think our friend, we have a mutual friend, Malcolm Spellman, who's a writer, producer on the show Empire, and I think he, the way he put it, I thought was, was really smart, and he said, don't be afraid of what you don't know. And so if you're afraid, of your ignorance and you try to hide the fact that you don't know something, pretend like you do, then you're never actually going to ask the people around you who do know the questions that you need to ask to learn about, you know, at least some small piece of what their lifetime of experience has, has taught them. How do you two work? What's the division of labor there? For writing? Yeah. yeah. For writing, um, so once we have an outline, we'll divvy up the scripts. Mm -hmm. It's the two of us and we have two other writers, Brian Cogman and Dave Hill. and. Uh, once we figure out which scripts we're writing, Dave and Brian will write their own script individually, and then we'll take the others, and, and uh, Dan might write the first half, and I'll be writing the second half, um, and then we swap paths and rewrite each other. And, uh, you know, we've been friends for 20 years, so there's a shorthand, and there's also a kind of, I think there's less of a fear of offending, you know, yeah. if Dan writes a line of dialogue that I think isn't working, I'll just yeah. write a note saying, I don't think this works, yeah. and it's not. It's just a lot. It's 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 one of those. Also, the, the the way that we have to write the show, which is under relatively serious time pressures. Uh, if you write if you write uh, sixty pages in very short order, there's 
it takes a certain kind of hubris that I just don't think we have to decide that those p scenes that you cranked out uh, really, really quickly are perfect and should not be tampered with in any way. They're, they're not perfect ever, so. Is it freeing now to be ahead of the, the book, um, or is, is, is that another uh, anxiety it's, uh, area? It's freeing and terrifying at the, in equal measure. Yeah, I mean, I think there was always, um, there was always a, a kind of a comfort in knowing, even say season five, where we who had already deviated significantly from the books, we had certain set pieces um, from George's novels that we knew we were heading towards, and and, uh, and you know whether it was um, the Walk of Atonement or or, um, or something else that's the first one that comes to mind. Um, season six is the first time where, aside from a couple of scenes on the Iron mm -hmm. Islands, um, it's pretty much entirely original. Um, I don't know if original is the right word because it's still an adaptation. Obviously, mm -hmm. it's still George's characters, but it's uh, none of those scenes take place in the books, at least yet. So it's that's nerve-wracking, but but also yeah, also liberating. I mean, there was there was a uh, there's it's just different writing a scene. If you're if you're taking a scene from a book and and uh, trying to figure out how to make it work, it's you're exercising different muscles in your brain than if you're inventing a scene whole cloth. And, and uh, I'm mixing metaphors terribly here, but. Uh, <laughs> Regardless, it was it was fun. I think it was the we'll most fun season to write. We'll sew it all up in the end. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. But, uh, yeah, no, I can, I can imagine it would be both. I mean, you know, you want to remain true to this person that has inspired you mm -hmm. so greatly. At the same time, you've got to get going. You, mm -hmm. you, you know, it, it, like piles of money are burning every minute. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, the ship, the the, with this ship is not going to, it's a very big ship and it's not going to stop. So uh, when we knew that going into it, uh, we, we just the one thing we didn't know going into it was that we would still be around six seasons in because we didn't know that going into it that we were going to be around for a second season. You know. Yeah, I remember saying um, uh, very early on, saying, "What would happen if we caught up with George's books?" Because he was working mm -hmm. on the. He's working on the fifth, but he still felt like we had a lot of time. I remember when we kind of did the math and we started counting, well, this is how long he takes yeah. and this is how long. We said, oh, if that happened, it's going to be like the sixth season. And if, if we make it to a sixth season, like things are going to be pretty good. So, yeah. And then it happened. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But going past Martin's storyline doesn't seem to have hurt the show's popularity. In 2016, Game of Thrones picked up another 11 primetime Emmys, including the top nod to Benioff and Weiss for their writing. It now has more Emmys than any other scripted series on television. Now, the conversation was so interesting, we kept recording. In part two, we talk about what they hope the legacy of the series will be and what's next for them. And of course, dragons. You'll want to check it out, but if you miss any of our programs, you can always stream them at video.idahoptv.org. For Dialogue, I'm Marsha Franklin. Thanks for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this interview recorded at the Sun Valley Writers Conference in 2016. And don't forget to subscribe to this podcast to hear more of the engaging speakers who shared their thoughts with me on their work and the world. Presentation of Dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore and Bettis family legacy of building the great state of Idaho. By the Friends of Idaho Public Television, and by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Check out our website, become a friend on Facebook, or follow us on Twitter.